I sorry, I look a bit like I'm on a ghost train or something at the moment. But anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was different when the uh, when the daylight was showing. Anyway, I want to talk about a, a little known aspect of uh, the Beatles, which is the uh, influence of four dentists on their lives, or at least the uh, coincidence of the of four dentists in their lives. So everyone knows uh, John, Paul, George, and Ringo, but fewer people know Bert. John, Michael, and Gordon. Uh, dentist number one uh, is Bert Sutherland. Bert Sutherland was uh, John's uncle by, uh, Mimi had a sister who, uh, called Aunt Mater, and Aunt Mater was married to Bert Sutherland. Uh, now the, uh, the other Beatles uh, disagreed with uh, John that he was a working class hero. They saw him as by far the most middle class of the Beatles. Uh, uh, one of uh, the aspects, these tiny degradation, uh, not degradations, uh, gradations of, of class, uh, uh, was that uh, he called his aunt, Aunt Mimi, not Auntie Mimi. In other words, he lived in a house with a, a name, not a number, Mendips, uh, uh, opposite a golf course, and it was a privately owned house. But perhaps above all else, they said that uh, he had a dentist uh, uncle in uh, Edinburgh. And of course, that is a very middle class thing to be. Uh, John, as a child and up to the age of 17, used to go and stay with his uh, Edinburgh cousins um, and used to enjoy it a lot. He used to do good middle class things like going to the Edinburgh Tattoo uh, and also used to go to the Croft uh, further north uh, and uh, had a lifelong love of, of bagpipes as a result of it. Anyway, Bert's influence on the Beatles came uh, when John was 21 and Bert gave him uh, a, 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 a princely sum of a hundred pounds, which in these, these days would be roughly 2,000 pounds as a present. Uh, John uh, decided to take Paul on holiday to Paris with this money. So the two of them set off, uh, John aged 21, Paul aged uh, 20 or 19, uh, to uh, Paris. They set off with Elvis quiffs, which everyone used to wear in those days. Uh, they went to see their friend Jürgen Vollmer, who's from Hamburg, who is living in Paris. And Jürgen Vollmer uh, was uh, sporting a, a fringe, and they wanted one too. And so Jürgen got out his uh, scissors. This is 1961 in uh, October, I think. And, uh, and he gave them their famous mop top cuts. So when they came back to Liverpool, everyone was sort of laughing at them and saying, what's all that about? And John said, oh, you know, you might laugh, but this is the future. And sure enough, uh, three years later, two or three years later, 1964, uh, almost half the world, or certainly half the youth of the world, was sporting these mock top cuts. Uh, to such an extent that when George Martin went to uh, Edinburgh, uh, to New York with the Beatles in uh, February 1964, uh, he saw uh, businessmen in Madison, uh, Avenue, uh, walking around with Beatles wigs on, and 20,000 Beatles wigs a week were being sold in New York alone. So this is an extraordinary uh, influence of one dentist in Edinburgh. My second dentist is, uh, is a more a seedy kind of character, John Riley, a dentist in Harley Street, who is uh, a fashionable uh, dentist, so fashionable that he managed to get the uh, Beatles as his clients. He never wanted to a fashionable dentist, I don't think. Um, and uh, first he got George, he needed the most uh, cosmetic work on his teeth, and then the others. And they became such friends that they actually did invite him out to the Bahamas uh, for the filming of Help. And one point in uh, 1965, in April, uh, he had John and George and Cynthia and Patty, a wife and uh, girlfriend, round for dinner. And at the end of dinner, uh, his wife, uh, who is called Cindy, who had the, uh, a job, uh, unlike most uh, dentist wives, she had the job of choosing the bunny girls for the Playboy Club. Um, she came uh, through with coffee and they said, oh no, we've got to go. And she said, oh, but I've just made the coffee. It's delicious. You must have some. Anyway, they had the coffee. Then they said, well, we've got to go in our car. And she said, oh, we mustn't get into a car. Uh, that's been laced with acid, LSD, which has suddenly come on the market in England. Uh, they were at first furious, but then, of course, it started uh, coming in waves. 
Cindy, they knew something was happening when Cindy thought she was in the Bismarck and shouted, uh, the Bismarck is sinking, the Bismarck is sinking. Uh, and from that point, uh, uh, Cindy, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Cynthia started thinking the room was sh shrinking. Anyway, they managed to get to Leicester Square where their club was in the car. Once they got to the Pickwick Club in Leicester Square, they kept, all of them saw uh, the clients turning into animals, uh, pigs and uh, goats and so forth. Uh, so it was a kind of horrendous night for them. And then they, they went back to George's house in Isha uh, in his mini. Uh, Cynthia said that George uh, drove at 10 miles an hour all the way back to Isha. Um, the, both Cynthia and Patty uh, turned them off uh, acid for good, but George and John were both very, uh, uh, became very fond of acid. Uh, George thought it had changed his whole consciousness. Uh, John became virtually addicted to it. He was taking it at least once a day. And of course, you can't say uh, it was all bad because some of his greatest songs, like I Am the Walrus, came out of it. Um, Tomorrow Never Knows, a whole variety of his songs. So that is dentist number two. Dentist number three is Michael, Dr. Michael Zook from Alberta, Canada. Now, he's much more recent, comes way beyond uh, the Beatles era. Uh, what had happened was that John had gone to the dentist, John Riley, and John Riley had taken out one of his molars. Uh, John then gave it to his, the molar, this very discolored molar, to his housekeeper, Dot Jarlett, uh, whose daughter was a great Beatles fan, so Dot gave it to the daughter. The daughter then kept it until 2011, when she put it up for auction, and it sold at Omega Auctions for the amazing sum of £19,000, this tiny, dirty tooth. Um, and uh, uh, the man who bought it was this dentist from Alberta, Dr. Michael Zook. Um, now, uh, Dr. Zook, originally, when he bought it, uh, he said it was just for to display in his surgery and to show dentists, to try and enthuse young dentists about the, the glamour of the dentist's life or whatever. But uh, more recently, he has confessed uh, that he actually bought it to make a lot of money out of it. His idea was he would get DNA from it and that anyone he was going to advertise for anyone who suspected that he might be a child of John Lennon um, to come forward and then he would give the DNA, they would compare the DNA. And once they got a, a match, they would approach the Yoko Ono estate, which is at the moment worth 400 million pounds and uh, they could split the profits. Um, so he did actually, uh, Dr. Duk Zuk did actually uh, say, uh, he said, um, it was a business opportunity. I bought the tooth, not because it's a stinky, rotten tooth. I was, I was thinking, how can I turn this into something which pays for itself? So, naughty Dr. Zook. The fourth and final dentist is a much uh, uh, healthier, sweeter character. He was called Gordon Mitchell. And on the afternoon of the 30th of uh, June, 1965, he was cutting the hedge in his garden of Mulberry Lodge, uh, which was in the village of Harold, H-A-R-R-A-L-D, uh, in Bedfordshire. And he was cutting away at his hedge when who should pop up but Paul McCartney. Uh, Paul McCartney uh, was there because he'd been traveling down from Yorkshire with a, a small entourage of three friends, including Peter Asher and his press uh, officer, Derek Taylor. And on the way back to London, uh, they wanted to stop somewhere in the country. And Derek Taylor, also on acid, had chosen Harold in Bedfordshire just because he thought it was a very funny name. And so they turned up and they asked uh, Dr. Mitchell uh, whether he knew the way to the river, or Paul asked. Uh, and Dr. Mitchell said, oh, yes, it's the you know, turn left, turn right, and so forth. Um, and then uh, Dr. Mitchell went, rushed back into his house and said uh, to his, uh, his wife, Sheila, um, you'll never guess what's happened. Uh, Paul McCartney's just put his head over the hedge. And she said, well, I've got to meet him. I've got to meet him. So they rushed and uh, tried to find the, uh, Paul McCartney, who was obviously, well, still is one of the most famous people in the world. Um, and they caught up with him in the pub and they had some drinks with him. And uh, uh, Dr. Mitchell uh, told him about 
uh, his plans for the raffle in the village the next weekend for the uh, National Playing Fields Association and so forth. And after a bit, they said, well, would you like to come back for dinner? And so uh, Paul and the others came back for dinner. And their uh, daughter, Shuna, brought out a little uh, toy guitar, her toy guitar. And uh, she uh, and gave it to Paul, who immediately, instinctively started tuning it. Um, and uh, he then said to them, uh, would you like to, uh, to hear this uh, song I've just uh, recently written? And uh, they said, oh, that'd be very nice. And uh, he sang them the first, I think, public performance of Hey Jude. Um, understandably, Mrs. Mitchell then said, after Paul had left in the early hours, why can't every day be like this? Uh, and two days later, uh, they got through the post a couple of bottles of champagne uh, for the National Playing Fields Associ Association uh, raffle. Um, then skip forward a lot, many years, and John Updike, the great novelist, was on Desert Island Discs, and he chose Hey Jude uh, as one of his Desert Island Discs, and he said that the sound of the Beatles was like the sun coming up on Easter morning. <laughs> 